Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, connecting new money with old money since 2018. Cake Wallet and Sweetwater Digital are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Sergei Tikhomirov, a postdoc at the University of Luxembourg who studies the security and privacy of Bitcoin, the Lightning Network, and privacy coins. The two discuss his recent paper, A Quantitative Analysis of Security, Anonymity, and Scalability for the Lightning Network, if the Lightning Network provides what's necessary to have digital cash functioning on the second layer, its dangers and what drawbacks it may have, and of course, thoughts on Monero. Monero Talk starts now. All right. Sergey, thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Where are you uh, calling in from, approximately? Uh, calling in from uh, Luxembourg, a small country in the middle of Europe. Oh, well, yeah, I've actually been through that. was many years ago. I, I drove through Luxembourg. It's it's tiny, right? It's yeah, like... Yeah, it probably takes half an hour to drive around it. Yeah, I remember I remember <laughs> the park. Parking was horrendous. I couldn't find a parking spot. Yeah, yeah. The The country is small. The, the town that I live in, which is even not the capital, is also small. It's the university campus here. They are trying to rebuild this area. It used to be a steel mining industry here. And now they're trying to rebuild it into a new, you know, innovation slash education site, which is going pretty nicely, I can say. Now, is that where you got your PhD? Is that where you did your studies? Yeah, yeah, exactly. University of Luxembourg. Uh, I did my PhD. I started in 2016 and I finished uh, last year, 2020. Okay. And what did you get your PhD in? Uh, it's um, it's entitled uh, like formally um, security privacy of blockchain protocols and applications, and I was trying to come up with a title like a generic title that would encompass everything that I did. And when I just arrived, my only idea was I want to study cryptocurrencies because I was fascinated by the idea and I didn't know exactly what I should focus on. And uh, during the course of my studies, I've been focused on multiple things. So in the very beginning, I started uh, with Ethereum. Surprisingly enough, because my impression at the time was that Bitcoin is kind of outdated. Bitcoin will be superseded by these new blockchains like Ethereum. And I did some work in smart contracts and their security analysis, so like trying to understand what bugs uh, may appear in smart contracts. There are a lot of bugs. And uh, yeah, you probably heard of multiple exploits and how people try to fix it. Uh, then I decided to move kind of back to the basics, so to say and um, look more into the networking aspects of Bitcoin. But it, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting because I came into this networking stuff, not from the Bitcoin angle, but from the Zcash angle, because our lab collaborated with the Zcash Foundation and they had some um, grants and some kind of research proposals on uh, what are the privacy implications of peer-to-peer -peer layer in Zcash, but as long as they inherit the code base from Bitcoin and the networking layer is kind of similar, I decided, okay, why not generalize a little bit and do this study on both Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin Zcash, and uh, like other privacy-preserving cryptocurrencies. And here, whereas Monero comes in a little bit in my research, was not my primary topic, but I also studied it a little bit as kind of... Um, as um, one of these privacy-focused cryptocurrencies alongside Zcash and alongside Dash, which is uh, kind of weird, but probably not the primary choice for privacy-preserving currency. But but still, yeah, that, that, that's what I did in like 20, um, 2018, I would say, 2017, 2018. And then I discovered this thing called the Lightning Network, which is the second layer uh, protocol and network on top of Bitcoin for faster payments. And I decided to make it my 
primary research focus because I decided that I want to focus on Bitcoin, but probably I like I didn't want to dive that deep into very like intricate details on how to construct signatures or how to reshuffle uh, or refactor the code of Bitcoin Core. There are people who are kind of interested in that and I applaud them for their hard work. It's very important, but it's probably not something that I want to focus on. I wanted to focus on something that would make Bitcoin more scalable, more usable and fully, uh, you know, implement its potential as digital money. And this is where I think Lightning comes in and uh, especially its security and privacy properties. Uh, it differs, I would say, from layer one blockchains. There are many new kind of challenges and questions. And this is what I'm trying to uh, find the answers to right now. Yeah, amazing, man. I just want to get a little more understanding of your back. So you said it was it was through um, Zcash, through a, a um, basically a, a grant from them that you started the work. Uh, yeah, it it was part of my studies. Like in in the middle of my studies, our our lab collaborated with Zcash even before it arrived, and even the um, the hash function that Zcash uses for mining Equihash was invented in our lab by Professor Birkov, my advisor, and uh, Dmitry Koratovich, and probably someone else. I wasn't involved, it was before I arrived, but they invented this hash function that Zcash and many other cryptocurrencies use for mining nowadays. So the collaboration was there and uh, Zcash uh, people came up with a new set of research problems and grants and we took one of these problems. And it was mostly about uh, transaction linking. This was part of the work that my colleagues were more um, like involved in. I wasn't involved in that part. I took a a smaller part of the task, which was due, which was about the um, security properties of the of the peer to peer layer, like how transactions are broadcast, what uh, information can an attacker um, extract by just observing where transactions appear and who broadcasts which transaction first, and by correlating these timestamps, it it is possible to extract some information. That's that's my kind of layer one layer one background. Yeah, and we'll, we'll definitely get into that. Um, before you went, started your PhD at Luxembourg, were you already into cryptos? Were you, you know, independently involved in, in cryptocurrency? Yeah, in, in some fashion. I, I discovered uh, Bitcoin in late 2013. Uh, people who were around at the time may remember it was this bubble when the price went up to $1,000. And uh, I, like I was very excited. I learned about uh, things like Silk Road, and it sounded sound very inspiring. Like people can, can like, despite it trading some illicit substances and whatnot, which I I don't endorse as, as like I don't don't endorse using the substances, but I definitely can see the kind of um, promise of free markets, and the people want to go very <laughs> far in their kind of libertarian and crypto anarchist views and actually implement the stuff. This is very interesting was interesting to observe and i was discovering this uh, new thing called bitcoin and it completely blew my mind i was reading all like all my spare time i was spending reading about about bitcoin uh then uh, for for a couple of years i was um translating and writing articles in russian in one of the websites uh, called bitnovosti um which uh, writes about such technologies and we even organized um uh, a trip through europe and uh, a few people from that, uh, the team of that website, we made a film about the adoption of Bitcoin in Europe. And we traveled along Europe uh, trying to pay with Bitcoin wherever possible, trying to make like taking, um, making interviews with uh, shop owners or business owners or local Bitcoin community. We visited the famous Room 77 bar in Berlin where all the hardcore Bitcoiners uh, uh, come together every, every month or so. So this is what I've been doing in like 2014, 2015. Uh, and then I decided that, okay, it's time to go full time on this topic. It's definitely something that I want to um, spend my full time on. And I was researching different options and I chose uh, this particular lab that does cryptography and security and privacy research. So I went this academic route and decided to uh, get some deeper knowledge about, about, about the stuff. What what uh, skills or uh, skill sets and knowledge is necessary to to do what you did? Essentially, uh, analyzing the you know the traceability of Lightning Network and and other projects. Is it cryptography, mathematics? What what are the required um, background skills? 
Yeah, I, I would say in my particular case, it's a little bit of everything. So uh, I can prog maybe I'm not kind of a very professional programmer, but I can code some scripts in Python that analyze the data. I can extract the data from the networks. I can like spin up the node and uh, read the documentation, extract the data, and see how it how, how it uh, how it fits together. So I would say a little bit of everything, a little bit of math, of course, to understand what like basic notions uh, from statistics or something, uh, basic programming again to analyze this data and just understanding and just uh, understanding how the systems work, which may not be obvious on its own right, like how all these moving parts come together and what is the role of full nodes, what is the role of miners, uh, how transactions get propagated and so on. And uh, probably this is a kind of common experience. You can like when people study every topic, uh, that's what they encounter. The more the, the the deeper you go, the more your horizons kind of broaden, and you see how much you still don't know. And I realized that I can go into any of these subtopics on on peer to peer or on cryptography or on I don't know layer two, and there are lots and lots to be discovered and to be analyzed. And uh, yeah, there's only so much one person can do. And uh, I personally decided that that I would study layer twos in particular Lightning, but even within this subtopic there are more kind of subtopics even within this topic so lo lots to study there so let's get into it so lightning network uh it, is it private right so you know you talk to uh any bitcoin maximalists they're saying you know don't don't worry about privacy don't worry about fungibility it's all going to happen on the second layer known as lightning network is that true will lightning does lightning network provide uh, what's necessary to essentially have digital cash functioning on that second layer? Uh, well, well I, I would say, I mean, as probably any scientist will answer any question, it's kind of yes or no every time. It's all uh, it's all about the trade-offs. And while I can talk about uh, like what dangers Lightning presents and what kind of privacy drawbacks it may have, the thing that uh, makes it attractive for me as a privacy enhancing technology is that it eliminates completely this huge source of privacy uh, violations that is the public blockchain. So the whole point of Monero, for example, is how do we uh, obfuscate transactions so that the people who see the blockchain in the in the open in the open network cannot analyze it and cannot extract data. And Bitcoin struggles with the same problem and it uses coin join or other techniques which are not always effective and that are only kind of effective for people who are trying to use them. And for the majority of people, they don't even try to use them. And second layer solutions, in particular Lightning, they eliminate this attack vector completely. So instead of trying to protect the blockchain data or the transaction data, we just make it completely offline. So people who are not part of the transaction, they just don't see this data to begin with. And this is a huge step forward in terms of privacy. But of course, I, I wouldn't say that Lightning today is ready to be like absolutely private digital cash because of many kind of structural differences um, of this of this peer-to-peer -peer network. And even if we talk only about layer one, still Lightning leaves a trace on the layer one because you have to open the channel, close the channel, and this opening, closing transactions, they can be extracted and again, analyzed to some extent. And um, people talk about Taproot, for example, or Schnorr signatures making this less susceptible to an analysis, but uh, I haven't looked much into this. Probably it will um, prevent this attack to some extent. Probably not not fully, but we'll see. But on the layer mm -hmm. two, like on the second layer itself, we have this new, basically the whole new peer new peer to peer network where um, nodes act as liquidity providers, and you connect to some particular node. You um, shuffle your coins or you move your coins back and forth in your channel. Not like unlike the layer one transactions where you just broadcast your transaction into the network and it doesn't matter much which nodes you use to broadcast your transaction because it gets to everyone eventually. In the Latin network, you have this uh, ongoing relationship with a particular party that you open the channel to. And despite these parties being pseudonymous, they only have public keys. They are not required to share their identity and they uh, are not, of course, the protocol doesn't know about KYC and it cannot enforce KYC or anything. Um, you don't have this kind of network as a cloud where you just connect to any point in this network and it doesn't matter where you connect to. You connect to a particular point and then we can talk about like 
how people choose to connect to big routing nodes, the so-called hubs, and how it may become a danger to privacy. So, th th I mean, this um, I would say that layer two opens new um, attack vectors, which may be addressed to some extent, maybe not absolutely, but it eliminates a very important attack vector that layer one suffers from. And it remains to be seen which one is better and for which use cases. So this is where research comes in. And this is where uh, like people like me and developers and researchers are trying to find an answer, quantify it somehow, uh, and find a solution. Do you, do you think it's essential to have privacy or fungibility built into the core protocol level as well? Or do you think you know um, it can essentially be added on the second layer, which is what Lightning is trying to do for Bitcoin? You know, one, one of the major arguments that's taking place between, you know, the Bitcoin and the Monero community is this idea that, um, you know, you just you just can't slap on privacy and fungibility layer on a, later on a second layer, but it has to be built into the core protocol. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I definitely understand the point of like Monero people and uh, Zcash people and other privacy focused people. And I see it as very important to have privacy, but maybe not at any cost. Maybe there is a trade off everywhere. And if we like imagine the situation where we can have fungibility and privacy on the protocol layer, but it becomes so heavy, it becomes so computationally expensive, or it basically prevents other like functionality that the system becomes useless. It may be very private, but if no one uses it, it, beca it becomes useless in the end. So we have to strike a, a balance between the UX or between functionality and easiness of use and the ability to run nodes relatively cheaply and, and privacy. And I see it as a kind of multidimensional design space and Bitcoin occupies some point in this space and Monero occupies another point in this space. And there is no single answer like this one is better than that one. For some use cases, Monero is better. For some use cases, Bitcoin is better. But as far as I can see, uh, I mean, Bitcoin is definitely the dominant cryptocurrency with the highest market adoption and brand recognition and support from exchanges, wallets, and, and whatnot. I mean, it's hard to imagine a cryptocurrency wallet that doesn't support Bitcoin that only has, an, I mean, it may be dedicated wallets for Monero, for example, but if someone develops a multi-currency wallet, it would definitely support, support Bitcoin. So this is something that speaks in favor of Bitcoin. Of course, it's not so private if you take like the narrow definition of privacy, I would say, uh, it's not so private in terms of chain analysis and other companies um, exploring the blockchain and analyzing clustering transactions and addresses and whatnot. But on the other hand, because uh, lots of economic activity happens on Bitcoin and in this ecosystem, you have kind of a larger anonymity set, despite you being less private within this anonymity set, the set is larger, but within say Monero, you may be very anonymous, but the set of people who are using Monero is smaller. So potentially it's easier for someone to track you using not like directly your transactions, but some auxiliary means, I don't know, you connected to some block explorer, you connected to some, I don't know, your IP address got leaked somewhere on the exchange or something, and it would be easier to, tra to track you. So, I mean, I haven't done the full analysis and th there are only trade-offs everywhere. Of course, we, we strive for privacy and this is definitely something that um, attracts me in the space in general because the current banking system requiring KYC for every action and having the ability to uh, ban you or freeze your accounts for no obvious reason until you like, I don't know, prove that you're not a terrorist or something. Uh, this may become ridiculous quite quickly. So this is something that I think the financial system of the future would have to operate under a different set of assumptions. But um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> to show, um, answer your question shortly, I think privacy is important, but probably not at not at any cost. Hmm. How about this idea of you know putting Lightning Network or something like a Lightning Network on top of Monero? So uh, you're you know suggesting that you know for Monero to man maintain private on the protocol layer, it may run into uh, issues with efficiency uh, with being able to transact enough. I think there's people who, who would argue otherwise with uh, things like dynamic block size, but ignoring all of that, um, this idea of 
building a second layer on top of Monero is, do you see, do you ever think of that as a, a solution? Um, I, I did a very quick research on that note. I didn't look deep into that, but my under current understanding is that for, um, well, like the thing that I do understand from the Bitcoin point of view is that to implement Lightning Network, you need um, the following primitives. You need, need hash locks and uh, time locks. And time locks must be of two kind of two um, uh, categories, the absolute and the relative time locks. And as long as Bitcoin has these primitives, it is possible to implement the Lightning Network. Now, Monero, as far as I know, doesn't have uh, scripts. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you can write like these programs in Monero. Yeah, I, don't, I don't believe so, no. Yeah, and um, I, I read the recent, uh, recent uh, blog post about atomic swaps between Bitcoin and Monero, and I was uh, a little bit surprised because I thought it was impossible, but then uh, I realized that people probably somehow used the Bitcoin functionality and encoded some extra like um, information into the signatures on Monero, and they managed to do it somehow. But my, my current understanding is that because you, uh, okay, maybe you can implement hash locks in terms of adapter signatures and needs more research. I'm not 100% sure, but I think you cannot implement uh, like proper time locks of these two kinds. So you cannot implement like lightning as it is on Bitcoin. Maybe some other construction for second layer might be possible, but uh, it's hard to, hard, hard, hard to see uh, how, how it could be possible because the current layer two solutions, um, they're based on this notion that we have some private state, which is off chain. And then any of us can put this state onto the blockchain and finalize the state, uh, close the channel in other words. But then if I do it, you must have some, some period of time to dispute if this transaction was malicious, if I tried to cheat you by closing with um, with the wrong state. And that's where we need the notion of time lock and the notion of the secret being revealed. So maybe some type of layer two could be possible, but it would probably be less functional than the Lightning Network. So mm -hmm. th th this is kind of the trade that I'm talking about because Monero has this cryptography to protect the linkage between transactional layer one it uh, restricts the smart contract functionality, even compared to Bitcoin, not even talking about Ethereum with Turing complete contracts, even compared to Bitcoin. And also um, the transactions are just heavier. They take more like kil kilobytes. <laughs> uh, and, and I think it's kind of tens of times more, like dozens of times more bytes per transaction compared to Bitcoin. Um, so it's just heavier and less functional, but that's the trade-off. Maybe it's worth it, maybe it's not, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, people are talking now about, you know, Monero almost kind of being a second layer to Bitcoin. I don't know if, if you've heard people talking about it in those terms mm -hmm. too, right? So Monero being the transactional layer. Um, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend to be technical enough to no, understand I mean, the scalability, I, I, I but there are, there are those in the community. Um, Arctic, are you familiar with Arctic, Arctic Mine? Uh, he, he talks about it in a, a very eloquent way. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would disagree with the definition of, I mean, there are conflicting viewpoints on what should we call layer two. And someone can make an argument that, okay, centralized exchanges are also kind of layer two because you can transact within this exchange. But I would say that for me, layer, like, it makes sense to call layer two the systems that, first of all, inherit the security of layer one. Of course, you, kind of, you cannot inherit 100% of security. You have to make some kind of trade-offs but you at least try to inherit as much as possible from the layer one. And you um, maybe maybe kind of the key um, distinction between layer one in la and layer two is that on layer one, all information must be distributed uh, across all the participants in order for everyone to be able to verify. So this blockchain data must be stored on every node. And this is what makes layer one not very scalable. And layer two uh, escapes this restriction by saying, okay, we're gonna have a private state which will only exist on our computers. And then we get, we, we invent some cryptographic mechanism to link it to the security of layer one somehow. So it, it, it's about storage of data. It's about the fact that we don't like, as a lightning user, I don't have to store, I don't even know about all other transactions in the lightning network that don't involve my node. And this is where scalability comes from. So in that sense, Bitcoin and Monero are not kind of layer, they just, besides one another they are equally they are comparable they are layer ones both are layer ones 
Yeah, I don't think it's a good way of characterizing it. Uh, but the idea that people, you know, would kind of store their their wealth in in Bitcoin or not really use it so much for transacting. But then when they want to transact, they move into Bit, uh, Monero seamlessly through atomic swap, uh, eventually in a way that's, you know, uh, very, you know, fast, yeah, but, cheap, and then make their transactions yeah, there. Yeah, but th then the question is atomic swaps, but where does liquidity come from? Uh, for, for me, I mean, atomic swaps have been around, the idea has been around since like forever, since before I came into this space. But the uh, I would say that the commercial, so to say, the commercial applications of this idea, we can see it now in Ethereum in, 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 the, in the form of DeFi, where people swap tokens for other tokens and whatnot in a decentralized way. But uh, the key challenge, as I see it, in this atomic swaps is, is liquidity, because I want to swap my Bitcoin for Monero, but there must be someone on the other side to swap, wanted to swap the other way around. And mm -hmm. if we only depend on volunteers and only depend that it just so happens that someone else at, the, at, at this exact moment wants to swap in the other direction, then the exchange won't be usable because there will be no liquidity. If we want to attract professional liquidity providers, then it looks more like a traditional company with KYC and an office uh, and, and whatnot. So this is, I mean, I mean, I, I don't think it's, um, okay, maybe it's possible, but it's not highly likely that we'll see a very liquid and very decentralized exchange in this kind of Bitcoin to Monero. It may be possible on Ethereum and they're experimenting in this regard because they have a yeah. richer programming environment, but swapping Monero kind of, I don't mean kind of the tokens on Ethereum that represent Monero or represent Bitcoin. I mean like native Bitcoin for native Monero. Mm. I, I, I see it, uh, it either is a centralized exchange uh, with high liquidity, but with KYC, or it is a decentralized atomic swap, which is like very private, very anonymous, but most probably liquidity will be low. And if I have some large amount of coins to swap, I won't be able to find a counterparty or it will take a long time for me to wait until someone arrives from the other end. Are you familiar with Thor chain? Have you, have, have you come across Thor? Um, I, I've heard the name, but I don't know much about the system. Okay. I mean, it's, it's trying to be that middle of the road. Uh, it, it exists and is working, uh, but it's based on liquidity pools and the idea being, you know, it's not a centralized exchange. Uh, it's essentially um, uh, decentralized in, in nature. It's, um, it's, it's not as decentralized and trustless as an atomic swap in theory, but supposedly it's... Um, I, I don't understand it well enough, but supposedly it's, you know, it doesn't, won't require KYC AML and, you know, there, there's, there's no company running it. It kind of lives on its own through its kind of own smart contracts and creating these liquidity pools and allowing people to exchange that way. Um, but I, I totally, totally hear your points. Well, we'll see which, you know, where, where we, what direction we end up going. It does seem like, you know, there's uh, a lot of people trying to build these bridges between uh, these projects, particularly Bitcoin and Monero, and it's exciting to see and it's certainly making things more usable. Let's uh, let's go back to Lightning Network, though. So what are you know, what are the attacks that you talk about in your in your papers? What basically if you want to break it down, uh, what do you currently see as being the attack vectors against Lightning Network with regards to um, you know, uh, attacking its its ability to uh, obfuscate transactions. Sure, I, I think the fundam kind of um, many of the attack, if not all of the these new attacks on the Lightning, come from the fact that the its peer to peer structure is fundamentally different from the peer to peer structure of Layer One networks. And when I establish a channel with someone, it's kind of a long term relationship. So I lock some lock some of my coins. Potentially, my counterparty also locks some of their coins on their end. It's not required, but at least if I connect to your node, I establish a channel to your node, um, I put some burden onto you as well. So you have to maintain the state. You have to care about this channel when it's closed and dispute if I try to cheat you and whatnot. So it's kind of um, this dynamic in the network leads to people c trying to connect to nodes that are already well connected and there are certain game theoretic uh incentives that lead to this outcome uh for example these liquidity issues the routing issues uh lead to this 
kind of centralized structure of the network. And the opponents of the Lightning Network, try, uh, they, they like to bring it up and uh, say, OK, Lightning is totally centralized to have these huge hubs and whatnot. And this may be true to some extent, but I see our goal as Lightning researchers to provide as much privacy despite this network structure. So we cannot fight with economics. We cannot force people to open channels to nodes that they don't want to open channels with. So we have to assume that these economic forces will try to centralize the network, but we must ensure that even if it's centralized topologically, if there are like 10 large hubs, still it's impossible or very hard for them to figure out who is paying to whom and how much and, and whatnot. And uh, to that uh, note, uh, of course, okay, with the layer two, we have eliminated this huge source of privacy uh, violations, which is the common blockchain. Uh, the public uh, public knowledge about the state of the blockchain. But still, if, if I'm routing a payment, um, it goes through multiple hops, and each hop knows uh, the amount, because each node must know the amount to know if it can forward it or not, and which channel it can forward it through. Uh, Lightning uses onion routing, and uh, technically, the intermediary nodes don't know who the payment is coming from and who the payment is going to. There are, there are some kind of um, uh, caveats to that, but at least they can see the amount. And this is kind of one, one of the obvious attacks is that uh, large hubs can track amounts. And if some entity controls multiple nodes in the network, and if there is some specific amount going through through this node, and then in a few seconds it goes through that node, it can make a reasonable guess that this is part of the same payment and correlate these payments somehow. There is another attack that I've been paying attention um, in the in, in the past m months, and uh, the paper like we've released a preprint of the paper, but then after that we have reshuffled it a bit and produced what I believe is a better version. Uh, probably it will be released rather soon about the so-called balance probing. So in the channels, uh, each channel has a capacity, which is the total number of the coins that is locked in the channel, and it is constant and doesn't change until the channel is closed. But then the balance is how the funds are distributed within this channel. And theoretically, this should be private because if I open the channel to you, then okay, the, the blockchain knows and everyone knows that we have opened the channel with this amount of coins. But then I start making payments, receiving payments, and no, no one knows how much I have in my channel. But in fact, it turns out it's possible to send what's what what is called probes or fake payments that are targeted at specific nodes and then they may fail due to one of two reasons like either because they're just incorrect and the, the, like the hash the payment hash is incorrect or because there is not enough coins on on this target channel and because the attacker knows why the payment has failed the the, the attacker who is the sender who sends these fake payments can determine okay mm, this channel has a balance somewhere between zero and 1,000. Let me send 500. Like if it goes through, uh, the balance is above 500. If it doesn't go through, then the balance is lower than 500. I send the payment, I observe the results, and I shrink my interval of my of my of my estimates. And um, this, I mean, on the one hand, it's a privacy attack because it helps it lets the attacker reveal the balance of some remote node. On the other hand. It's useful uh, in the wallets, and the wallets actually do that um, to try to find a route that will not fail. Because we have this problem in the Latin network uh, with routing. It's not like what some people may believe. It's not the pathfinding itself in the graph, because this problem can be solved quite efficiently. But it's the fact that um, we don't know the like the balances of remote channels, and if I want to forward through one of your channels, for example, I only know that your channel has a thousand coins in total and I want to forward say 500, but I don't know if your balance is above or below. Like, are you actually able to forward what I want to forward? And mm, technically at the moment, the only, uh, the only uh, way to find the answer is just to try and observe the result. And uh, this is essentially the same the same technique that the attacker can use to re reveal these private balances. So th th this is kind of this trade-off again between efficiency and privacy. And um, there are kind of m multiple thoughts on how we can address this. Maybe we should um, maybe we should charge a fee and um, make these payment attempts, fake payment attempts, more expensive for the attacker. Because for now, if they fail. The attacker doesn't pay anything. The attacker just has to put some coins in, 
and then it can get all the same coins out. It doesn't pay anything. This, this is one problem. Um, so yeah, I would say this is kind of privacy issue. Um, there is a related issue which uh, may be even more serious, to be honest, and more kind of uh, a showstopper, so to say, is the denial of service attack vectors that um, the attacker basically can initiate the payments. So the payments normally go in two stages. So first of all, the coins get kind of locked along the path, and then the receiver unlocks these coins and um, all these balances along the path, they get atomically shifted to the side of the receiver. But the receiver can wait and just do nothing and not redeem their payment. And the liquidity along the whole path will be locked for the duration of, of this timeout. And here's a trade-off here again. Uh, the timeouts in Lightning Network may be pretty long because we want to make sure that in case of a dispute, the parties have enough time if they go offline, for example, they must be able to come back online and dispute this transaction. Therefore, these timeouts are on the order of hours and maybe even days. So if the attacker sends a payment to itself or to another node that the attacker also controls and just doesn't redeem it from the receiving end, then this liquidity just is left hanging and uh, no one can do anything. And the intermediary nodes, they don't know. Uh, I mean, they cannot uh, do anything. Just part of their liquidity is occupied, and they they must wait, and they must uh, kind of um, forego the profit that they might have earned if this liquidity was available for other payments that that went through. And uh, this attack has an even more, uh, I would say, dangerous flavor or mutation, if you will. Uh, it's not the liquidity, the number of coins or satoshis in the channel is not necessarily the limiting factor on how much a channel can, can forward or how much a channel can have so-called in-flight at any point in time. So at any point in time, each channel has some balance on this side, some balance on that side, and also some coins in flight, which are kind of in the middle, and they cannot be used for other payments. They are committed to some payments which have not yet finalized. And the problem here is that there is only a certain number of so-called payment slots in each channel. So each channel can only hold up to a certain number of concurrent payments in flight. So if the attacker sends lots of tiny payments, which are very cheap because in terms of Bitcoins, it's just, I don't, I don't know how many dollars, but I don't know, a dollar or something. Uh, but each of these payments occupies a slot. And if all the slots of the channel are occupied, then the channel cannot forward anything anymore. So this is something quite dangerous in my opinion. And one of the papers that I co-authored uh, described and quantified this problem, how it affects the Latin network, how it affected this in, in the past. And there again are uh, different proposals, but um, uh, some, some people suggest that we should take again like upfront fee and the attackers should pay upfront some amount before creating this uh, payment. But the fundamental issue here is that when I'm forwarding a payment through your node, I am occupying some resource that, that you control. And uh, if I'm anonymous, if you cannot punish me, if I don't even know, if you don't even know where these payments are coming from, then I can uh, abuse this privacy preserving uh, functionality to occupy all the payment slots that you have, all the channels that you have, and just make it another service on your node. So I think this is something that should be addressed. Uh, otherwise, if it's not addressed, then the nodes will just demand people to go through KYC or identify themselves when they establish channels or when they forward payments. Because otherwise, if, some, if, if I'm running a routing node, it's my business. I want to earn money on fees. And any anonymous uh, attacker can block my revenue stream for, for days. And I have no way to, to, to punish them. Then I just won't open, won't let people open channels to me unless they uh, de-anonymize themselves in some fashion. So this is something that I would rather not see developing, and uh, we have to invent some technical means to prevent this. This probably will happen to some extent, but still, I want uh, the people who want to remain full anonymous to still have this option. And um, in in the worst case, it will be just a few large nodes, and if you want to route around them. It will be just no liquidity, and if you want to forward a no, 
more than uh, $20, you want to find enough liquidity outside this KYC part of the network. So uh, I think our goal as researchers and development and developers to not let this happen and to suggest some technical countermeasures so that maybe there will be some KYC part of the network, but the non-KYC part of the network must be significant and must offer an option to, to people. Mm. It seems like the direction Bitcoin is going in is towards being more traceable. I, I know, I know they're, you know, they're implement trying to implement new, new technologies. Um, you know, Lightning itself is the promise of Lightning is to, uh, you know, uh, implement privacy. But the reality is, uh, you know, you have these very large chain analytic companies that are becoming more and more powerful. Uh, they have more and more resources. I think, you know, some of them are, are already valued at like a billion dollars. Uh, obviously, governments highly value these companies and, and the services they're offering. Um, so there, there's this this war going on, right? This, this kind of this race. Uh, obviously, it's happening in Monero, too. But in, in Bitcoin, uh, you know, the the other side seems to have a greater advantage, the, the, the side of, of tracing, right? Because fundamentally, Bitcoin is traceable. Um, and, you know, they're trying to catch up. Whereas with, with Monero, it's kind of already has the castle walls built around it. Uh, and it's now just trying to keep the castle walls up. Um, do you think uh, Bitcoin will, uh, you know, essentially win this 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 battle will it get to the point where it becomes more digital cash like or will the these other side the other side that's battling against it gain more resources and continue to gain more more data and more heuristics and more ability to to track and trace uh, especially with the fact that um uh, Part of the reason Bitcoin is moving in this direction is it's it's really become more about number go up than you know let's build digital cash. Uh, it's allowed it, that's helped Bitcoin obviously get to where it is today, but it's now politically influencing the direction of Bitcoin, where you know the biggest players in the space maybe don't care so much about privacy uh, and about digital cash, and you know maybe. Uh, be more kind to the request of governments or, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, they, they're, they're thinking more in, uh, in along the lines of, all right, well, what do we need to do to make sure the number just continues to go up, even if that means uh, satisfying the regulators? Uh, well, I'd just like to hear your opinion there. And on a technical basis, do you, yes. do you think Bitcoin eventually gets there? Or that it it it's gonna lose this battle. Uh, I mean, that's the million dollar question. I mean, I don't know the answer, obviously, but I, I think it's you know, it's useful to separate the kind of Bitcoin core development and Lightning development from the broader ecosystem. And even if the players in the in the broader ecosystem, like exchanges, like investment funds, they uh, I mean, their job is to earn money. And if it's easier for them to earn money by collaborating with governments, they will do so. It's completely kind of, I don't blame them, it's their job. But if I'm looking at the technical discussions and at the development, then as far as I can see, Bitcoin developers and Lightning developers put a very heavy emphasis on privacy. And they, uh, I mean, it's hard for me to imagine them introducing some deliberate feature that would compromise privacy for the sake of, I don't know, so something else. Uh, on the other hand, they operate under very strict constraints. And probably the one thing that's even more important for Bitcoin development than privacy is maintaining backwards compatibility and everything that all the all the coins that have been created so far in the past what 12 13 years they must remain valid and it's completely kind of unacceptable to introduce any breaking changes or hard forks therefore you have to maintain this legacy which might not kind of incorporate privacy preserving technology that were developed af afterwards so this is the constraint that people are operating mm -hmm. under and this is kind of fair enough this is the ecosystem I think it's, uh, I mean, the analogy that, that I, I like to think about it, I think it's kind of useful, uh, is to think about file sharing networks in early 2000s. And I think I've read some 
very interesting analysis about the comparison between cryptocurrencies and file sharing networks. And um, there were multiple approaches as, as, as soon as people realized that you can share uh, music and uh, videos with your computer with other users of the network, this space exploded. But then there was kind of, again, multiple points on this design space and something was quite centralized and what was shut down quickly by law enforcement. Something was so decentralized, it was impossible to shut down, but it's, it was also inconvenient, inconvenient to use and people were just, weren't just using it. But there was that, this one protocol, BitTorrent, that, we, that exists until this day and people are using it maybe not to that extent than 15 years ago, but still considerable amount of traffic goes through BitTorrent. And um, it's kind of took the middle path, so to say, you have to go on a website like the Pirate Bay, download a torrent file and open it in your local, local client. And um, someone might say you have this weak spot, you have this attack vector, people might shut down your website where you download torrent files. And guess what? This actually happened and they shut down Pirate Bay multiple times. They shut down like all these popular torrent trackers but they opened new websites, they opened mirrors of these websites, they incorporated in various jurisdictions where it's hard for, say, American law enforcement to go into. And in the end of the day, it turned out to be just decentralized enough to survive and to provide a decent UX for users so that users are willing to upload the content and share the content in these networks. So in, 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 in some sense, I see kind of similar things happening in cryptocurrencies. Some cryptocurrencies are very privacy centric on a technical side, but can they gain enough network effects, enough traction to actually become meaningful in the broader world? That's a question. Some other things, obviously there are like, if you open CoinMarketCap, I don't even recognize, I don't know, 70% of the names there. And these are just coins that are centralized, but they were created to, I don't know, make a quick buck or enable trading or enable some other applications with a focus on functionality uh, at the expense of decentralization. And I mean, that's okay for people to try, but I wouldn't be surprised if many of them would shut down or would crash or whatever. And Bitcoin is somewhere in the middle. I'm not, not to say that it necessarily will go like BitTorrent and remain uh, <laughs> this kind of protocol that survived, but it seems well positioned to do it, of course. I mean, I would love to see Bitcoin have a larger role that BitTorrent has today, because even though BitTorrent survives, it is a niche kind of product and people are mostly, I don't know, using Spotify or YouTube or whatnot, totally centralized services that can ban you and so on, but they're convenient and people are using it. Mm, I don't know, but the fact that there is this kind of alternative, there's always an alternative. That's the niche that I want to uh, be filled with at least with some project, preferably yeah. multiple projects. Definitely, definitely, all, all, all good points, good insights. Um, I think, I think we're seeing, you know, ignoring coin market cap. Um, you know, just in terms of usage, you know, you go to you go to places where crypto is actually being used, what it was intended for, which is digital cash. So you know, uh, on the in the dark nets. So. so Supposedly, Monero is becoming the, the coin of choice there. Uh, you're seeing with ransomware, um, those that are still asking for Bitcoin are no longer getting away with their with their ransoms. So they're all moving over to Monero. Um, just anecdotally, I just came back from a, like a libertarian festival, and uh, you know there was a lot of um, Monero use there. Um, so ignoring coin market cap, which is basically mostly just speculation, or really is primarily, uh, in terms of use, I do think you are starting. You know, you're seeing things like Monero being used more than than Bitcoin yeah, for for its actual intended use of digital cash. Is yeah, Bitcoin? I, I, would, uh, I would kind of uh, not not necessarily disagree with you, but I don't. I mean. Mm, who, who are we to say that the digital cash use case is more valuable or more, I don't know, preferred than the speculation use case? Just the market shows that lots of people are willing to speculate and lots of people are using cryptocurrencies and tokens to speculate. And 
uh, like who am I to disagree? Who am I to prohibit them from using yeah. it that way? No, of course. And I'm, I'm not. I'm not disappointed that. I mean, uh, it would be nice to see this digital cash use case to skyrocket in the same manner and people paying each other with Monero or, or with Bitcoin. But uh, I mean, the fact that we have this DeFi explosion in Ethereum, though it's not that interesting for me personally. I'm just not kind of interested that much in swapping things for one another just to extract profit it's kind of, i mean but but, but I, um it may introduce many people to the very notion of holding your own private key what is a transaction how do you sign transactions how do you broadcast what does it mean to be like transactions confirmed and so on and uh lots of people are going to learn what is what is a hardware wallet what is a wallet and uh later on they may use it for digital cash use case i mean not necessarily the tokens that they use for trading, but maybe other cryptocurrencies. So, uh, yeah, I mean, happy to see adoption uh, there as well. El Sa have you been following El Salvador? What's going on there? Uh, obviously, I mean, I think uh, every everybody knows the news. What's your opinion? So they, they're mandating it as legal tender. Uh, it appears that most of the use of Bitcoin down there will be through um, essentially, you know, custodial wallets. Um, what's your take on that? Is that you know a step in the right direction for Bitcoin, or just a step is a step? It doesn't matter. Uh, how do you view that? Uh, it's. I mean, it's hard for me to comment on the political side because uh, there are lots of people who are more familiar with the. Like political landscape of uh, Central America, I've never, I've never ever been to that. Part yeah, of the I'm not talking about the politics. Just this idea of that, you know, uh, Bitcoin is is seemingly going to be used there, uh, right? It, because it's essentially being mandated that it be accepted as legal tender, but it seems like it's going to be used there in um, a non-ideal way in terms of, you know, what the, the original vision for crypto was, right? So peer-to-peer. -peer. It doesn't seem to be that it's going to be used in that way. It's going to be going through these apps uh, that are custodial. Uh, Lightning is going to be used. So do you think that that that's, that's still good for Bitcoin? Or does that, once again, does that you know, move it in that trajectory more of number go up, um, compl let's, let's, it's now will be friendly to, to regulators and governments, uh, and it starts to lose that peer to peer nature. Um, well, I, I mean, on, on the one hand, uh, I, I, I think it's something wrong with like mandating people to accept Bitcoin and Bitcoin is about like free choice and free will. And it's, it doesn't look very good when the government comes at me and like forces me to take Bitcoin. I mean, it would be more in line with the original like libertarian ide ideology if all Bitcoin acceptance and uh, adoption would be completely voluntary. But again, on the other hand, we cannot prevent any particular president or head of state from writing a law and mandating Bitcoin. It's also like the freedom of this president to decide. What worries me a bit from the technical uh, side, I haven't looked deeply into that, but as far as I can see from like Twitter discussion, the wallet that they are gonna gonna use, it will again require personal information and it will be like government mandated wallet, uh, something like that. And the kind of counter argument that, oh, don't worry, you have only to provide that same information that the government already has about you, like your address and whatnot. I, I don't I don't buy it to be honest, but like because one thing is just to know that I live at a certain address and have certain uh like social security number or like citizenship number. And another thing is to link all this information to all my monetary transactions. This is completely another level of uh surveillance and I wouldn't like to see Bitcoin adoption in, in Salvador to be abused in, in, in this way. So um, just let's see what technical solutions they, they actually employ. Uh, and um, I would say that the community should like, as, as strongly as the community has celebrated the announcement and made a big celebration and a big, you know, uh, people <laughs> dancing and singing in Miami celebrating this announcement, I, 
I think it's worth applying the same uh, kind of force into uh, like pressuring them to actually um, adapt Bitcoin in the right way, to, so to say, to not to not force people to use it, and at the same time provide all the information and link all their transactions. In that way, they move into the like Chinese direction, where they track all the purchases and they track people with face recognition and all that scary stuff that I don't want to see anywhere in the world. So let's see. And um, on the yeah, but uh, the last uh, the last point that I want to make is that um, on the one hand, like from the Lightning standpoint specifically. This is a very kind of this brings lightning into kind of public consciousness, and people are talking not only about Bitcoin itself, but lightning as a way to use it in retail transactions, which is, I think, very very good for like public um, re recognizability. But still, as a researcher, I don't see lightning hundred percent ready for this yet because there are many unsolved problems, and like if we hit serious adoption and serious transaction volumes will lightning be able to handle it mm, well i mean probably yes but there are many unsolved problems like again denial of service attacks it's not that expensive to make a denial of service attack on the whole lightning network so what happens if like there is country of a few million people everyone is expecting their bitcoin payments to go through in in a few seconds but then some attacker anonymously blocks all the like big channels in in big hubs what happens then so lots of technical challenges to address but on the other hand such adoption uh motivates and uh, incentivizes further research and development so it's uh yeah exciting I know, exciting I know, I know the i know these are tough questions but uh you know i just this is, these, are, these are things that I think, you know, they're obviously not, you know, they're the million dollar questions, like you said, or the billion dollar questions. Yeah. But this is this is what people want to hear. I know this is what, and I, we want to hear from, you know, intelligent people like you that understand the technology better than most. I mean, uh, you understand Lightning Network on a very deep level. Um, our I'm kind of kind of re re ask this other question and kind of in a different way. So the, the chain analytics companies, right? So they're currently their bread and butter right now is being able to track and trace Bitcoin, right? And now Lightning Network exists and is starting to uh, potentially gain some adoption. They're not just sitting there and, you know, waiting for, you know, you know, uh, 10 years to say, all right, let's go try to figure out how to track. And I mean, there, there are obviously already working on it. Um, are you familiar with anything that they're doing or how they're thinking about this? Um, uh, I, I'm not familiar. Any, any with insight any... there as to how what you can guess is going through their minds with regards to Lightning Network and how they might be approaching it? Uh, I'm not familiar with any like specifics of what they're doing. Uh, as far as I can remember, a few a few months ago, it was um, a news headline that some american i don't exactly remember which uh department or something published uh, uh like offered uh six hundred thousand dollars for research into traceability of monero and the latin network yeah it's the, tre in, in, the treasury department yeah yeah yeah, sure. yeah exactly exactly so uh, th this is the sign that they are definitely looking into this and i won't be surprised if it turns out that s at least some of the big nodes in the latin network are operated by chain analytics companies of course i have no proofs i i don't i don't know but it would be strange if they didn't even try to spin up one node and like experiment a little bit with it, it, it just <laughs> they would be incompetent if they didn't do that mm, but as as with any privacy preserving technologies it's a game of cat and mouse and it's a game of who like attacks and defenses who gets there first and um yeah i think um uh, most likely they are, um, okay, let me put it this way. So as far as I understand, again, it's not my speciality, but uh, their clustering techniques are based to like a large extent uh, are based on the linkage from exchanges. So when people buy and sell Bitcoin, they identify themselves with the exchanges and the exchanges give them some addresses. And because it's kind of known the big exchanges, which pools of addresses they have, and there, like you, you can check where people buy Bitcoin from exchanges. On the Lightning Network, like from the first glance, if it would be possible for me to buy Bitcoin on the Lightning Network and just receive it straightly like, directly to my wallet without leaving any, any trace on any exchange, it would be brilliant. And I won't 
go through any KYC and whatnot. But a technical challenge that uh, prevents this from happening on a large scale is the so-called income and liquidity problem, because for me to receive coins in Lightning Network, the channel that I have with you, for example, must have some coins on the, on, on your side for me to receive this coin. So I have to either spend some coins first, or you have to uh, dedicate or uh, allocate some of your coins to my channel. And this is a whole separate issue. It may be possible like for me to buy liquidity from you. So I pay you some Bitcoins on chain, you open a channel to me and I receive through you. There are people who, or like businesses who, who do that, but it's, Kind of a little bit ugly, and many many um, retail wallets or mobile wallets that advertise the instant receive functionality. They are actually custodial, and that at that moment, so they are holding your coins and like show that you have the coins. And only if you like try to move them, then they actually open the channel or something. And that's the long way of saying that uh, potentially, like midterm, it could be possible to uh develop new ways for people to obtain coins through lightning that would be more privacy preserving because they wouldn't have to go through traditional exchanges but again we must solve some lightning technical problems first so of course chain analytics companies are analyzing that i would be surprised if, if they don't of course they don't have this huge amount of public blockchain data as in the layer one so this already makes their job harder but if they control many or at least a significant portion of large nodes and if they track all the payments that go through them then most likely they will be able to track again like some significant amount and uh, again with mobile wallets for example there are mobile wallets that connect by default to that wallet's node so that wallet's developers who maintain this node they know that most likely the channels that are open to them are the users of their wallets and then they can again like have no proofs, haven't looked into that, but technically it's possible to link somehow their uh, phone identifier or their Google ID or something with their wallets, with this node, with their payments. So it's a game of cat and mouse, but uh, people are thinking about this seriously. And there are serious attempts to route to Tor, for example, uh, to um, again, like from the protocol development standpoint, people are definitely taking privacy seriously. and they are not trying to um, to trade off privacy for something else because this is perceived as very important. And just so for my for my understanding, that some of those scenarios you're talking about, this the most ideal way to use Lightning would be if you're just opening up your own uh, channel, right, with the other person that you're looking to transact with, as opposed to going through. A node, correct? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a very good point, and uh, I, I wanted to clarify that, but forgot. Thank you for reminding me that all these issues with routing and with large hubs observing the transactions and whatnot. This only um, this is only a concern if you are routing through multiple nodes. But technically, if you only want to transact with a specific person or business, you can open a channel directly to them, and then no one else sees your transactions except for for you two. But of course, this doesn't scale. And the whole point, like That's, why Lightning yeah. is called a network is because you don't have to open channels to everyone that you want to transact to. You just have to connect to a network and your counterparty connects to, to, to the same network and you and you route. This is where a large part of the functionality comes from. But technically, you don't have to route to the network. You can just open a direct channel. Right, but like you said, that would, that would be unscalable, right? Because now uh, you're you're constrained by the Bitcoin network itself. And you can only have so many people onboarding at a, at a time, right? Yeah, yeah, and you can only. I mean, if if you don't want to route through anyone, then you have to open channels to everyone that you potentially want to transact with, which is right. kind of kind of crazy, right? So let's uh, let's move to Monero. Uh, so we, you know. We, we talked about Lightning Network, but you, you've also obviously studied uh, other other projects, right? You, I think you've you've taken a pretty good look at Monero. I think you've looked at Zcash as well. I don't know what other projects you've looked at, uh, but Monero in particular, what's your, what's your take on Monero? Do you think it's um, working as digital cash as as it's currently promising? Yeah. Uh uh, I, I'm not an expert on Monero, I should say. I definitely respect this project because I think it uh, follows this 
initial ethos of Bitcoin and this initial vision of digital money, unlike some other projects that came afterwards with more heavy emphasis on like financial aspects, trading and loans and whatnot. This has its place in the world, but uh, from the like, what what got me interested in the first place is this notion of digital money, and Monero definitely falls into this category and into this kind of, yeah, basically a similar ethos to Bitcoin. Um, as far as I understand, again, I haven't looked very deeply into that. Uh, it makes a set of trade-offs uh, in order to achieve better privacy cryptographically, and uh, it's 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 up to the to the market. It's up to like. Uh, the future to decide whether the trade-offs are worth it or not. Uh, the transactions are heavier. Uh, the blockchain is heavier than, than than Bitcoin. Bitcoin transaction takes only a few hundred bytes, uh, whether a Monero transaction is a few kilobytes in size, as far as I'm aware. Also, we mentioned earlier in the talk that the smart contract functionality is also not possible. That limits the Monero's potential usage in terms of second layer networks or other sophisticated contracts that are possible in Bitcoin. They may be not that popular on Bitcoin either because it's hard to write them, but at least it's it's technically possible to write them. But on the other hand, again, you cannot just open a block explorer and see who paid whom, when, and and, and, and so on. On, the, on that note, um, yeah, and uh, by the way, before our talk, I looked up some numbers and I was just interested in uh, like how active is Monero's development, how active is the network, the hash rate, and so on compared to Bitcoin, because I wasn't aware like how how is the network feeling, and the the numbers that I, that I saw, uh, I mean they're quite positive. I mean obviously it's less than Bitcoin, but it's growing. The hash rate is growing. The number of transactions is also growing, I suppose. And um, what else? Ah, the development activity. I looked up on uh, GitHub to see like how many contributions, how many commits Bitcoin has uh, compared to Monero. Of course, it's much less for Monero, and this is something again like um, this concern that I have about alternative projects, even if they are technically sound, is attracting developers, attracting researchers, and just collaborators mm -hmm. and nurturing this ecosystem and. Um, Monero is doing pretty well as far as I can see. Of course, there are fewer contributions and fewer commits, but it's it's not negligible. So I see that the the process is going on and people are actually looking at the code and improving the code. So that's good. Uh, so yeah, I mean, a good project. I, I respect it. I'm not following it closely, but I'm glad it exists. And there should be different attempts and different approaches in this trade-off space. No one knows what will win. So let's let's see what happens. I wish all all the best to the developers and uh, uh, the community. Yeah, I hope you look into it a little bit more. Um, it, it sounds like you're you're very much interested in the the digital cash component of crypto, and that's that's certainly what Monero is most interested in. So it'd be great to to have you uh, taking a closer look at Monero. Are you familiar with the the dynamic block sizes and um, are you familiar with random X? I'm just I'm just curious how how closely you you've looked at Monero. I mean, I, I'm familiar with the fact that uh, it is CPU mined. I didn't look at the specifics of the hash function, and I'm not an expert in the kind of internal workings of the hash function. I definitely remember a few years ago when there was this um, like fuss about um, what was it called uh, Hive. Uh, like when people incorporating Monero miners on web pages and you go into web page and your computer starts heating up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Coin Hive, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that, that, that was an interesting experiment. And while many, like some, like I, I don't endorse people doing that on their users' machines without their consent, but as a way for monetizing a website, if I, as a user of a website, if it offers me an option to either like, have myself tracked with cookies and advertisers or dedicate some portion of my CPU time to mine cryptocurrency. Uh, I would likely prefer to mine a little bit of cryptocurrency for the, for the website as a, as a way of monetizing this. For, for me, it looks quite a promising direction potentially. Um, yeah, I, I don't know about dynamic block size, by the way. Maybe you can tell a bit more. Is it is the block size dynamic in Monero? Yeah. I mean, in, in simple form, uh, yeah, yeah the, it's, it's not a fixed size. So... And who uh, determines how large can it be? Well, it's you know it's it's based on an algorithm, so you know it, it's it's it 
scales dynamically with, with is, is there some upper limit or some some limit on the speed of, at, at which it can, yeah, at which yes. can grow? Yes. And that actually plays into the tail emission that Monero has. So, you know, miners would be penalized if they try to make blocks too large, too fast. Are you familiar with the tail emission? Mm, you mean that just emission just goes on indefinitely? Yeah, it yeah, reaches a, a nominal cap and then it continues to emit Monero thereafter at a constant, uh, constant amount. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's a choice. Bitcoin has one choice. This is another choice. Yeah. I don't have, like, um, on the one hand, from the kind of purely ideal market point of view, as long as the supply is predictable, it shouldn't matter what the curve looks like because all the market participants can discount all the future supply as they like and, exactly. uh, you know, kind of mathematics. But on the other hand, as long as markets are not completely rational and people also get drawn to, the, like, emotional arguments, this um, this mantra or this slogan about there will only, only be 21 million Bitcoin. And like, if you own one Bitcoin, you potentially own like one over 21 million of the whole global you know currency. That sounds very, very exciting. And that attracts people and it attracts capital and it makes itself a self-fulfilling prophecy. So maybe there is a role to that as well, though mathematically it shouldn't right, matter. But, it, but, but does, it, does it sound too good to be true, right? So, I mean, the, the, the idea with Monero is that they're placing a bet on the fact that uh, to maintain the security of the network forever, uh, there'll, there'll always be coins to mine as opposed to relying on transaction fees in the future. Yeah, but I mean, I, I get this argument. This is also something that worries me, but probably it doesn't worry me that strongly because, I mean, if Bitcoin succeeds to a degree at which, like, we hope it succeeds being the digital gold and replacing, like, at least replacing gold and potentially something more, then I think at any point in time, there will be enough people willing to transact to cover cover the fees. Even if these transactions will only be like large settlements and each transaction will cost a hundred dollars to 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 make and all the activity will move to lightning or other layer twos still i mean even now uh there is already significant i don't remember the exact numbers but it's like an order of 20 percent or something of miners revenue coming from the fees not from the emissions so it's not negligible uh and potentially it will grow even further so uh it may be a problem. It may not be a problem. We'll see, depending on the adoption, depending on like how many of these settlement transactions happen, and uh, the more like the more economic activity we attract to this whole ecosystem, including Lightning, including maybe some custodial solutions as well, uh, the more demand it is for base layer transactions as well, because you have to onboard people, you have to settle at some point. So this is the source of revenue for the for the miners. Yeah. I mean, arguments made in the Monero community is that Monero might even be, be better suited for a second layer uh, because there won't be any fear that if, uh, uh, you know, the vast majority of transactions move to the second layer, that there'll still be the security of the base layer because there'll always be coins to mine. Uh, yeah, which is yeah. It's, it's an interesting way of. Uh, but, but, but it's not free. Any, I mean, if you have tail emission, essentially it means that the. Uh, value of all existing coins get diluted. So it's basically a tax on all the holders as opposed to the fee that the uh, transaction centers pay. And the, I mean, for me, the difference is that the transaction fee is much more explicit. So when I'm paying a transaction, I have this like button, do you want to pay, I don't know, a dollar or $10? I click yes or no, it's my decision. But if the supply gets diluted, it's kind of sneaky a little bit though technically i know it gets diluted but still it's kind of well no i mean i, I think the argument right so let's say you're just a holder and you're holding a million dollars or a billion dollars in bitcoin uh shouldn't you be contributing to the security of the network i mean so in a way you kind of are right with a tail emission as you said because you're kind of now you're getting diluted a little bit and what you're really uh what that tax is really paying for is to maintain the the security of those coins that you're holding yeah, yeah. I mean, it it may be reasonable. I mean, both approaches sound quite reasonable to me. And while Bitcoin, for like just for historical reasons, has chosen this approach, it's very unlikely it will change for Bitcoin. It's good that we have other currencies that experiment with other approaches. We'll see which one 
uh, looks better, but Bitcoin has made its choice and it just continues to develop under this set of constraints that uh, just historically were introduced by Satoshi and early developers. And because of this heavy emphasis on compatibility and the lack of hard forks in Bitcoin, which is also a very kind of interesting and unique approach, because as far as I understand, Monero and Ethereum and Zcash all do hard forks and break compatibility. And Bitcoin is this lone kind of player who says, no, we only do soft forks no matter what. Uh, many design constraints, many technical constraints, but uh, let's see how far we can go with that. How about uh, just so, so mining for a second? So obviously you're aware that Monero is essentially CPU mined. It has random X. Um, purpose of random X being it essentially turns the CPU into the ASIC of, of Monero. Um, do you think uh, mining centralization, the potential for mining centralization in Bitcoin is an issue, uh, potentially leading to uh, censorship? You know, if we, if we have just a few large, large miners, a few um, producers of ASICs, um, is that a potential attack vector on Bitcoin? Yeah, uh, I mean, again, I haven't looked deeply into that, but in that sense, uh, I see Bitcoin as uh, quite a unique system because it makes this it makes use of this very uh, deliberate industrial grade mining ecosystem. Unlike, uh, I guess, all other cryptocurrencies that are proof of work mined, they are GPU mined or CPU mined, and the ones that I mean, the ones like Bitcoin Cash that inherit the same hashing algorithm, they are kind of automatically in danger because a very slim fraction of the Bitcoin's hash rate can attack Bitcoin Cash at any time. And this is just not going to work long term, I think. Uh, if you are a CPU mind or GPU mind, again, it has pros and cons. And uh, I think there are research papers written about it, which, which I haven't read. Um, so I, I heard the argument that if you are a CPU mind, you are more prone to like uh, mining through botnets and other people's computers being hijacked to mining cryptocurrency, which again, as we've discussed, can be like a good thing or a bad thing. Um, in Bitcoin in particular, like on the one hand, I see that this um, huge mining farms, it's like it's impossible to run them anonymously. And it's clear that these people exactly. have their legal structures and they have agreements with electricity suppliers and whatnot. And as we've seen recently with the uh, banning of uh, yeah, in China, and I think today Bitcoin hash rate drops uh, historic like minus 20 something percent, which is a historic uh, record for downward uh, adjustment in hash rate, which which is not a catastrophe in its own right, but it just shows how, how much of the hash rate is migrating from China to somewhere else right now. Um, yeah, so on the one hand, they cannot be anonymous. But on the other hand, we see this jurisdictional arbitrage and say some states in the United States are welcoming miners, some countries in Central Asia are welcoming miners. And in Russia, there are lots of electricity in Siberia and not that many population centers, other, other, people, uh, other places around the world. And this, uh, like just the basic fact that the sun shines uh, to all the regions on Earth, and you can extract energy basically from all the regions on Earth. Of course, like not all the regions have oil or gas or uh, fossil fuels, but everyone has sunlight and can ex extract the energy from, from, from the sun. And I think it means that essentially it will be very hard to concentrate the Bitcoin miners in any like one place or just a handful of places uh, long term. Right. But they, they are consolidating, wherever they are, they're consolidating into these large corporations, right? It's not, it's not people mining in their basements. It's not people mining on their own. And, uh, and it's not people that have the ability to essentially, like you said, uh, mine without detection. So, you know, in China, I think what, what's concerning about the China thing is, uh, you know, it's it's nice that we're not seeing mining happening in China for 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 various reasons, right? Because of um, their totalitarian nature, right? We don't want them to really be kind of the backbone of of this new monetary system. Uh, so it's it's almost good news that they kicked all the Bitcoin miners out, but it's also indicative of the fact, or 
it shows that you know these miners are uh, approachable and can be coerced by governments. Uh, so whether they're shutting them down or whether they're leaving them open and coercing them in other ways, basically uh, forcing them to censure transactions. Yeah, but uh, like Chinese government can censor their miners today, but it's kind of hard to imagine some kind of coordinated action uh, involving China, the US, Russia, Europe, uh, America, like South America, Africa, and whatever the miners may be. Uh, it's it's possible that any single country will ban miners or will um, pressure the miners to censor transactions or do some other kinds of activities. But I, I don't see like how how can, how can the whole world coordinate in this attempt to censor transactions? For example, some mining pools may censor, and I have already seen the headlines like this mining pool issues compliant blocks that don't include the transactions from like the blacklist of the US yeah. yeah yeah and they may uh, of course if they want to like uh forego part of their profit and uh just basically they are paying in in uh, in missed profits they're paying for their um uh, compliance with regulations and that's their choice uh but as long as we have this um issues between the countries and especially by the way as long as we have uh the us controlling the global financial system and controlling the payments between the countries which is kind of ridiculous if you think about it like the trade between russia and china happens in us dollars and basically the us can censor the transactions between two completely unrelated countries because it just controls the the the, the global monetary system and in that sense uh bitcoin can be used by these governments that we may not like as like probably you 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 are as i am like in favor of liberty and in favor of freedom and uh, and democracy and the governments that will make use of this technology they may not necessarily be uh democratic or liberal at all but as long as they com are competing with each other they uh basically it provides them with a way of circumventing other countries sanctions or other countries censorship of their transactions in the regular financial system and as long as bitcoin provides them with this way uh, with, with, with this kind of way out uh it will be valued and it probably won't be completely banned i would say around the world because it fulfills this kind of a bit of a geopolitical role i would say but, but again at home mining also has its role and it's again like another, another set of trade-off and if, if you are mining on cpus like, like maybe the last um, argument or the last thought that i have on this on this topic is that um bitcoin has this very deliberate infrastructure and the whole industry producing very specific mining devices and distributing them and setting them up and so on. And uh, I would imagine it would be very hard if someone, if some government even tries to like make a very direct 51% attack and say, okay, let's just buy more equipment that, that than the network currently has. It would, it would be very hard and just the production pipeline <laughs> Uh, like all all the all, all the production pipeline that can produce Bitcoin ASICs is already producing them for like legit legitimate miners. And if, the, if some, some government, if some attacker comes in and, sa and and says, I can give you infinite amount of dollars, just give me more ASICs than the whole network has combined, it will still take potentially years to produce this many devices. But if you have CPUs, you can buy. Uh, I think you can buy on the open market pretty quickly. The same number of CPUs that Monero is currently mined on. I'm not particularly sure, or like what the numbers are, but I suppose it should be like more manageable. I don't know, like what's your thought on that? To just buy on the market as many. Well, CPUs I think I think that have. would you know cause a race, right? So now, now it's now you have the, it's the people versus the the government, right? So that that might cause uh, you know the the masses to wake up to it and to start yeah. to. But, but uh, I mean, you, you don't have to tell. To the Monero network, right? So, because everybody has a CPU, you know, everybody, not everybody has an ASIC, you know, yeah, yeah, like but pretty but, much but, every but human attacker. being at this point has, has a CPU in their pocket. Uh, but only, only a select few have, have ASIC. So I think, I think the government's easiest to attack wouldn't be to go and try to out ASIC the ASIC, uh, the people that already have ASICs, they would just take over the, the miners. 
they would just take over the miners that have yeah, the assets yeah, already. But again, it's, it's possible within one country, but to see coordinated action across the whole world to take a significant portion of the network. So like before, like before this 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 month, we were in this potentially dangerous situation where more than half of the mining power was within one country, China, which could theoretically ban it, which it did, or censor or like pressure miners. But as long as we see that the hash rate is migrating from China, it's not migrating into some like concrete other spot in the world. As as, as far as I have read on on, on Twitter, the analysis, uh, uh, for example, Nick Carter, who I highly recommend his articles about Bitcoin energy consumption, um, like as as far as he writes, it's migrating to different places in different countries, and. As the result of this, as, as far as I can tell, we will see a more equal distribution of hash rate among the countries, and no single country will have more than 50%, I would hope. So it will make this attack more, more dangerous. But if you are like buying up CPUs to attack Monero, for example, you don't even have to tell anyone that you are buying it for this purpose. You just put a large government order to like a million CPUs or GPUs or something, and you just buy them and you like try to launch an attack. But if you buy a million ASIC devices, it's kind of clear what are, wh why, why you're doing that. And I suppose this information would leak and people will start paying attention before the attack starts. Mm. But it's kind of, it's, it's yeah, all I speculation. I, and, yeah. Uh, I mean, cur currently, we're, we're, we, without speculation, we're seeing government's ability to control ASIC miners. Uh, that, I mean, we, they, uh, an entire country just kicked out all their ASIC miners. So we, we we're seeing in, in, in real life that governments have the ability to completely stomp out ASIC mining in their country or can leave it running and control it um, because they, they've, they've just done it. Um, but uh, what was another? Oh, you mentioned the scalability of Monero. Um, I've, you know, it's uh, the transactions are, are larger. Um, what about this idea of, you know, hardware scaling and, you know, networks uh, scaling? You don't think that uh, those things will make up for the, the size of transactions? I mean, we, we've historically seen in technology the ability of, of hardware and things like that to scale with, with the need of how we use it, right? So uh, we're, we're having this video conference today, uh, you know, 10 years yeah. ago, this wouldn't have been possible. Yeah, uh, I mean, um, the blockchains have this unique property that when we're talking about, say, the size of transaction or the size of the blockchain, it's not just I have to transfer this number of kilobytes to someone else and then forget about it. Everyone has to store this piece of data for eternity to be able to independently validate the blockchain. So if you are taking like 200 bytes per transaction, uh, then you can fit this many into into a gigabyte or a terabyte. If you um, use 50 times as much, uh, then the amount of storage space that a regular consumer can can afford, say 500 gigs or a terabyte, like consumer hard drives that are w w widely available, uh, you just uh, like this point uh, in the future where the blockchain gets bigger than any widely available. Um, uh, SSD or hard disk, it's just closer to, to today. So maybe the technology will develop and the new SSDs will be even more, uh, have, have an even more volume faster than the blockchain grows. And this has been the case so far with Bitcoin. So Bitcoin also has this problem. It's just on a different scale. Bitcoin like, right. cons consumes yeah, that... like one megabyte per 10 minutes. Monero consumes like, I don't know exactly how much, but per transaction, it's like tens of times larger so it may yeah yes the technology may scale but as far as i can tell again i mean um uh i'm, I'm not seeing this volume of ssds for example growing that quickly as for example like 15 years ago it, it, it grew just immensely quickly but then it's kind of stopped kind of or is growing slowly and my assumption is that uh, many consumers don't even need to store that much data at home anyway because everything is in the cloud and the, the, the cloud takes care of all the storage and at home we just need a few hundred gigs for our you know, private files or something. But um, to be able to validate the blockchain independently, you have to store the whole history. And uh, yeah, that's basically large transaction sizes 
disincentivize uh, disincentivize the independent verifiers and whether it proves a kind of a critical flaw or is just a, a minor disadvantage I don't know. So, well, this, I, I will yeah. say today people are running full Monero nodes on their on their Android phones. I, I've, I've seen people in the community talk about how they're uh, able uh, to. Do are, that. are they are, are are they storing the whole uh, transaction history on their mobile phone? Um, I believe so. Yeah, I know they're running a, a full node on their on their phone. I've seen people talking about that. Um, yeah, and by the way, another kind of piece of statistics that I that I looked up before before this talk is how many Monero nodes are there. And there is a site called Monero Node Map or something, and it displays. I mean, obviously, not all nodes have to advertise their IP or something, something. But it's on the order of hundreds, like 200, 300, something like that. Uh, on Bitcoin, it uh, it's about ten thousand, I think. And uh, there are estimations that there are multiples of that of nodes that do not advertise their IP address. But again, it applies also to Monero. So like we can assume that Monero maybe has a few thousand nodes total and Bitcoin has, I don't know, 100,000 nodes. Mm -hmm. So it, it also makes a difference. Maybe it's not kind of critical, but it shows that more people are ready or are willing to run Bitcoin nodes. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the size of the blockchain is not the determining factor here. Maybe just more people are interested in the Bitcoin than in Monero, but the size of the blockchain also plays a role, I would say. Yeah, it definitely does. And then we, we also have to take into account that Monero is is working on implementing technology to, to make its chain and transactions more efficient over time. So, uh, you know, obviously it's going to be growing more rapidly because there'll be more transactions, but hopefully with each of those new transactions, it will be growing in a more efficient way. Um, and I, there's always new tech being worked on. I guess I, I just, uh, last question, and I appreciate your time. This, this went on for a while and I, I know uh, sure. your, your, your time is, is, is very valuable. Um, just uh, if you could just give us an idea of, I mean, you're, you're in, I'm sure, very interesting circles over there, right? So uh, you got your PhD over at Luxembourg. Um, you're 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 in the know with crypto. You understand Lightning Network very well. You're surrounded by very intelligent people that that study this stuff. What uh, what is what's kind of the uh, general take on Monero among among your groups of people that you know? Is it talked about? Uh, obviously, you know it's you know you're you're you're. A, you're into Bitcoin and you want to see Bitcoin succeed. Um, you, you're studying Lightning Network. You're pointing out its flaws, but with the hope that they get fixed. But uh, I'm curious, are, are there discussions of Monero? Is Monero talked about? Is it something, is it respected in your, in your community of people that, that look at crypto? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I guess I could say so. I mean, it, um, it's not the probably not the, the primary topic of uh, discussions, but is definitely uh, one of the topics that academics write papers about. Probably you've seen the paper about anonymity in Monero. There are a few papers, I remember like a year or two ago, there was a clever paper about the network vulnerabilities in both Zcash and, and Monero. And uh, mm, probably I should look it up. Another, another lab in our university has released uh, some paper on Monero, probably also on peer-to-peer. -peer. I can send you a link later on, I will, I will find it. So I, I would say that um, pr probably doesn't attract that much attention as Bitcoin from the academic standpoint, but it's also, uh, I mean, it's also in this kind of, in this area and people are looking into it as an example of a project that makes a heavy heavy emphasis on privacy specifically alongside Zcash, which is also very interesting and also very inter interesting cryptographically with zero knowledge proofs. So yeah, I, I would say it's a, uh, it's, it's a known part of the ecosystem, probably not the primary focus of, uh, of people, but definitely as part of this privacy preserving or privacy focused technologies, it's, it, it, it has its role. And uh, yeah, people are looking into that. And I hope that um, people who are not necessarily committed to any single project, but have a more kind of broader view may see some similarities and some differences and introduce ideas 
from this project into that project and vice versa and learn from each other. And this is what I find valuable in, 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 in the research community is that uh, researchers um, combine the knowledge in a way that's not obvious and extract knowledge from different places, different projects and try to apply them in, in other ways, which uh, should be useful for, for everybody. You know anybody that's working on that IRS bounty for Monero? No, not, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> Someone probably is. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm just curious if, if it's in your circles. No. Um, not that you would want to reveal that anyway, I guess. But thank you so much, man. Thanks for coming on. Greatly appreciate it. Where can people learn more about you? Where can they uh, find your papers, follow you on Twitter? Just, just give us your... Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think I just uh, g give you a few links and you attach them in the description. I'm on sure. Twitter. Uh, you can visit my homepage. The link will also be in the description and it has all my uh, contacts, links to my papers and talks. And I would be happy to uh, answer questions and uh, discuss these uh, topics with your listeners. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, man. And, and like I said, uh, you know, Monero community would, would love to have you in, in any way possible. It sounds like you're, you're interested, but you know, if, Want to stop on by more more often? Please do. Uh, maybe maybe you want to do uh, a, a, some research project regarding Monero. Uh, I'm sure it would be uh, much welcomed. Thanks a lot. All right, man. Have a good one. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.